Hello, hello. Hello. What's up, Ed? You are the second Englishman we've had on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> was Jeff the other? Yes, he was. Um, <laughs> nice. I'd, I'd been trying to get him on for a while to talk about his uh, effects work. Yeah. Um, like his, his digital stuff, less so video, but more like his digital um, like backdrops, which was really cool. You know, talking to him about some of his like musical inclinations as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, I've had a you know a fair amount of opportunity to work with him along, like sort of alongside him and around him. And yeah, great guy, really, yeah. really interesting as well. You know, the depth goes so much further than uh, than just his work. You know, but it lends into it as well. Yeah, yeah he guy. he unpacked some of like what he was doing and his thought processes behind it, and it was just like I had no idea that it went went that deep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> super awesome. cool. Well, Phil, would you mind hitting the the recording? Yes. So we're trying this new thing where I record the Zoom call and then he records the screen. Because when you okay. record a Zoom call, it automatically crops it to whoever's talking. Okay, but we, yeah. we, we miss all of the second and third camera reactions. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he'll record the screen on his end and we'll like, I can manually crop in and out if there's something, you know, that we want to catch that Zoom didn't. So yeah for sure that's cool well uh ed we appreciate you for uh hopping on looking forward to getting into uh we were literally just talking about black and white versus color and uh can you help <laughs> us <laughs> yeah well i mean i don't know if there's i don't know if there's like really a really a debate but actually uh i think it's more of like how you kind of can perceive things like in the real world as you're taking pictures and then how you see the end result and like I think for me, or at least like how I ended up doing more stuff, more photos in black and white, more video in black and white was I just started seeing a lot more that way in my head, like the end result that way. Where it's like, I think a lot of other people leave the house with like a couple rolls of film and it's color film and they just know like I'm coming back with like beautiful colors and, or if they're going out and shooting digital, they'll be like, I know I'm coming home and I'm using these presets or I'm going to play around myself. Whereas for me, it kind of cut out a lot of that other noise in my brain. And it was like, black and white is the way this is going to come out. And if the shot looks good in black and white, I'm just going to enjoy that. And then that stuck for me. And it just ended up becoming a thing, not by any uh, force, just sort of happened. It's awesome. kind of like a nice way to land in a bit of like in, a, in an artistic style. To me, black and white photography um, shows the truth where with color, you can hide things. Yeah, for sure. Like, That's just my metaphysical like, analysis of photography. But Well, there's like elements to each side. And now I think actually a lot of journalistic sides and a lot of uh, papers and online papers, if you're shooting uh, the truth, a documentary you're not even allowed to send raw edited images anymore they need to be the direct jpegs out of the camera um and they're not allowed to be manipulated in you know unless unless the work calls for that if it's documentary i think a lot of the workflows are now jpeg only directly to the editors hmm. well awesome so like well that that removes a lot of what i was saying where like i'm thinking about how this is going to look in black and white and you know, and then in my in when I'm shooting in my cameras, like the screen is black and white, and like everything I'm looking at is in black and white. Um, and then and in like the end, skip the middleman, and like you're you're seeing the result as it will be, as you're working on it. Yeah, I just I get like a lot of over stimulation from a lot of the colors, especially how I found more modern cameras that have like the electric viewfinders react to lots of colors, how the modern sensors react to a lot of colors. If you've got a lot of fake stuff going on, you've got like LED lights, at least at concerts or on film sets now, these lot of LED lights, which react weirdly with the camera sensors. And like you get a lot of artifacts. So I think like when you're shooting in black and white, at least for me, like all of that is removed in, in the moment. I'm allowed to just make sure like everything's looking good and feeling good for me. And I can just like sort of freely shoot. Um, I think I'm trying to like kind of emulate using an older camera as much as possible on like modern gear for work, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like just trying mm -hmm. to have 
the clearest image possible, with less distractions, less buttons, less stuff going on on the screen, and more just kind of allow it to happen. And then I'll look at the end result on the computer and go, oh, I fucked that up. Or like, oh, that looks really good. Like, is he, you know, the end result is the, the main thing, of course. But yeah, it, it's about enjoying the process, I think, for me, is how I ended up using it more. And mm. that's, I, think I, I think I can appreciate it. But it doesn't mean I like it any more than color. It's just, just how I, I've ended up using it in my workflow more. Oh, awesome. Interesting. Uh, for those of you who sat through that long introduction, <laughs> this is Frame Let's This Podcast, and we're <laughs> like, honest to God opening. <laughs> um, Frame This Podcast. My name is Nate. I'm here with uh, my co host, Philippe. And uh, how's everybody we're, doing? We're joined by Ed Mason from London, UK. He is uh, a photographer. And um, if you listen to the brief intro, we're talking about black and white specifically. Um, Ed, would you mind introducing yourself a little bit uh, more in depth and kind of tell yeah, us a little sure. bit about what you do and how you got started? Yeah, um, I'm a photographer based in London, um, mainly work in music, uh, do a little bit of other stuff here and there, but been mainly shooting bands for the last 12, 13 years in and around London, um, more specifically in like punk, hardcore and metal just sort of grew up with that music, grew up with that scene, um, was playing in bands and then started carrying cameras around with me and shooting on the road and just like wanting to contribute to shows more than just playing in bands or, you know, I was putting, occasionally I'd put shows on and put bands on, sometimes I'd play in shows and it was always just like finding a way to kind of contribute um, and kind of the rise of MySpace and Tumblr and, social media, my photos, just from, you know, out being at, at shows and snapping gained a bit of interest. And then I started to see that maybe if I put more time into this, um, it could be sort of a fun thing to do in between uh, other stuff that was going on. Um, and yeah, pretty much how I ended up like working full time now, uh, taking photos for various magazines and, and bands across social media. and um, yeah, being able to tour with some bands I grew up with, going to shows and watching them too. So yeah, it's been a fun, fun journey so far. And yeah. Awesome. Pretty much me. Yeah. Where did, where did that journey start? I feel like with a lot of creative people, it, um, it started early, even if you didn't like pick up on it until later, like, were you always a creative person? Like, has that always been like a part of your life? Yeah. I've always, always played music um mm -hmm. i've always had guitars loved like playing around with pedals the minute like i could record into a laptop or computer like playing around and not really making anything that was uh you know like an end product just sort of like playing around and i guess like how eventually when that merged with photography and being visual it kind of felt like it was all one of the same thing which i think like a lot of creative people that have multiple outlets kind of find that their music will blend into their photo or video or they'll use one to complement the other. Um, and I didn't do like too well in school and I didn't go to college or university or anything. So I just sort of jumped on the back of what I was already doing and knew how, and I felt what I felt comfortable doing, which was going and watching bands and like making stuff out of those shows, whether that was like photos or video or, um, you know, back in the day, even just recording some, you know, friends bands or trying to document live shows, filming multiple angles and cutting shows together. It, I wasn't really sure at the beginning how I was going to get into get well where it was going to lead me to, but I knew that I wanted to be uh, sort of involved in the music scene a bit more uh, somehow. Um, but yeah, I mean, just yeah, pretty much just through playing a band and carrying a camera around. Um, and prior to that, just I had a camera with me everywhere, and I had like an old. 35 mil uh like slr that was like kicking around my parents house and i think i just started carrying that around with me around maybe like 2008 or 2007 and started taking pictures around then just of friends family and stuff picking up getting used to that process um and yeah since then just kind of interchanged between film and digital just alongside each other um 
whether that's like a project for a magazine or, or, or working with a band or just shooting personal stuff. Yeah, just still, still doing it day in, day out and loving it. So with film, you don't always know how it'll turn out. What is the what is the vetting process like for say an editorial gig as a film photographer? I think I think there are many like safety nets now, and there are like not that many people just shoot film exclusively with like not knowing what the end result will be. If it's for maybe if it's for something that's for a brand commercial leaning on editorial, they're probably going to ask to maybe see the shot digitally first before like you kind of confirm them down on film or they would like a backup shot on digital too just so you've kind of got it just so everyone's ours covering um but basically yeah i mean it's it's a, it's a fun process i use film a fair amount and i use a lot of um expired films and unusual stuff i found i find and i picked up over the years and it's been stored in my fridge uh but you, you just kind of show your previous experiment to them uh whoever is putting the shoot together and just say like i want to shoot it on this and you know they trust you hopefully or they might (laughs) they might not but they might like the end they might like the idea of their project looking that way and you know that all you did to get that look was use that film in this condition and then you try and emulate that and it doesn't always go according to plan and um these days i try and use film more as uh, a bit of an extra thing as opposed to the main central workflow whereas there are other people who are doing the complete reverse as well yeah it's a good like uh add-on or like you know say you're shooting a wedding and they like the look of film but they don't want to you know like shit the bed on all of the other you know photos that you'd miss out on so you know just for this one, try to do some of the film versus, you know, doing. Yeah, others. for sure. And it's like including the workflow. It's very different. Like a lot of people are talking about like, you know, content creators and they expect like photographers to turn up and be able to like put together like a cinematic video at the same time they're taking photos. And a lot of the people who, you know, don't understand every single workflow, but they want a certain result in the end. Like all of these things, I think, the, f- the more you can separate them from each other, the better the result is going to be. But if you were trying to convince someone to do an all film workflow, they've really got to be on your side of trusting you and just happy to let you do whatever you want. Um, or they understand the process from start to finish themselves and they're used to working with film. If it was a magazine, then it's quite common here in London. A lot of magazines and a lot of shoots now are still film only. There are a lot of pro labs that still do a lot of just fashion and um and editorial work that's all just exclusively film and they all understand the workflow but for a lot of things like you said like film or you know smaller smaller projects for, for brands or businesses like they might not understand the, the film workflow and it's, it's completely different really if you were to just go off and shoot that and not be doing any video or photos then yeah it's, it's a different world really um yeah phil do you have a question uh, I was just gonna ask. You had you had the face. I know I had the face. <laughs> um, when did that transition start from just doing bands, uh, photography and videography, and when did you start branching out to uh, commercial and editorial stuff? And um, tell us a little bit about the. Um, hmm. Yeah, just tell us a little bit about that. I'm going to try and follow up with something. Well, yeah, it's kind of, I mean, it depends. I think a lot of it came from, like, what I was enjoying doing. And I've always enjoyed, like, just sort of being, a. I use it as like kind of a tool to be involved in stuff or a tool to learn more from others, whether that be, like, a new skill or you want to learn about a new topic. Um, for my personal work, it would always be like, I want to travel somewhere or explore somewhere. I want to learn more about that. Um, I'm pretty inquisitive in that way and, and love learning. Even if I didn't study, this is a kind of, I kind of use that as my way to, you, my camera is my way into stuff. 
even if it's just to sort of hang around and take a few photos in exchange for being there. Um, and, and often now um, I've been learning, uh, you know, m multiple different things and I use my camera as my way to, you know, figure that out. And so I think like when it comes over to applying those for if you're going to pitch for editorials or you want to do commercial work is like um, sometimes on the side, I'll work with local businesses and brands purely out of just wanting to, I've bumped into someone, I've met them, I've learned what they're doing and uh, how can I contribute and help your business or how can I make you better or how can I learn about you more? And I'll usually offer to kind of come and hang out with my camera and have a chat and get to know people. And that transition over through learning and using it as a specific tool allows you to build up kind of an interesting body of work that's quite diverse. So then it's full of different subjects, which you couldn't just put out as one portfolio because it would be just too, it would just look like a mishmash of stuff and people wouldn't know what your direction is or what your focus is um, but you know the the wide amount of work and people that i've worked with has just purely just been come from chatting to people and being interested and in saying hey i'd love a go at that and that's literally how i would say like 99 percent of my stuff appears is through that process of just being interested in it and wanting to learn a bit more about it and then it slowly transitions over when you build up the right amount of work. So that your networking is the secret <laughs> to going in different yeah, you, directions. I think so. If you can apply yeah, like if you can apply that in in that way, you know, some people might be really like focused and have a method to that. Like they want to go in a certain direction. They want to pitch for editorials. So they're going to, or they want to pitch for commercials and they specifically want to get that. Whereas for me, it'd rather be like a benefit of a friendship that, or like we work together on a personal project and off the back of that came a commercial or, you know, we collaborated on something that we both enjoyed or wanted to explore together. And then I could recommend that person to someone else. And yeah, I guess, Ultimately, networking will bring you those opportunities, but that's how I think I can have the most fun doing it. Um, getting to work with your friends a lot, people that you get on with, people you trust, and on the same wavelength. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I really. My favorite clients are ones that understand that once. So I, I do a lot of ink work, and like when you put down ink, you can't really do anything about it, you know. And I've had people like ask me to, you know, touch up or edit it later, and you you really can't <laughs> like, exactly. I'll, I'll show you the the pre-production and if you like that once <laughs> once the ink starts going down you can't really do anything about it um yeah. so do you do you find that like digital work is easier to commercialize because it's so easily like edited or easily fixed or do you still prefer the rawness of what you see right in front of you I mean, it's, it's it's different for different occasions. I mean, I like how I like how digital can sort of be applied to most things. Like most people can benefit from having a digital photographer work with them. Um, depends what the the necessary out, outcome of that is. But I think like in most cases. In most cases, I prefer shooting digital if it's for a specific commercial client. And then I feel like I can get as close to what I'm doing on film or, or, in, or in another process after if needs be. But like, it totally depends on client's needs these days. Like, you can emulate a lot of stuff, but it not be exactly the same. But I've got tons of friends who just exclusively shoot film and that is their workflow. And they'll, they'll go from shoot to negative contact sheet to handprint and then they deliver a digital version of their handprint and that's like the final result, which is like a much greater workflow than me just importing a photo and getting as close to the end result as I like and then delivering it digitally. Like there's another like three days involved for those people than there is for me. I think like, I think I've tried that workflow and it's so nice for personal stuff where you can really take a time but if you want to deliver something to someone and then be happy and you want to get a you want to get like a fast turnaround and like you were saying with back and forth with ink and people you know saying like oh can we make any adjustments well if you spent three days hand printing from a negative and you've been speaking with a lab and you're you know you're going far down a rabbit hole there with 
where you've got other people's opinions, uh, it could be it could be a bit stressful there. But digital it worked for me. Like I got a fast paced mindset. I need to like shoot it. I'll shoot a concert and I'll shoot two thousand. I'll shoot two and a half thousand photos from like a ninety minute concert, and I'll have them edited down to a hundred photos in like half an hour, and then I'll just have them done by the end of the night and delivered, and then I'll go to sleep. But I'd rather it be done that way than having to like slowly wait for films to come back and. And and maybe the shots are good, maybe they're terrible. Like you just don't know. Um, sometimes maybe good, sometimes maybe shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the what sometimes the ones that you get are the ones that you definitely cannot ever recreate. Is like no matter how hard you try, the ones that really stand out. You'd be like, there's something just about that that I'm gonna save that one. You know, cut that negative off and just the rest of trash. But you're just like, that's the one. Which does happen, from, you know. One or two shots if you're shooting like a, maybe a 35 mil camera on the side if you're shooting a concert you might get one or two shots in a 35 mil roll where you're like that's why i bring this yeah how do you so like if you're if you're touring with a band and they play the same songs and they do a lot of the same motions you know every night um when you're shooting with a film camera at a show like do you have to wait for like the right, I'm, I'm sure since you only have 35 shots for the whole, you know, like 30, 40 minutes set, do you have to like time it a little bit more so that you have a highly likelihood of getting the shot that you need? Yeah, I definitely feel like how, how I like layer it in, like I maybe just shoot that one roll, maybe two rolls and I'll sort of layer it in with what I'm doing, my routine of shooting digitally. So I'll be like, if I was working with like five members of a band, I would usually take a couple per role of each person, maybe try and spread it a little bit more over the whole role, as opposed to it being like one whole role of one person and pop in a new role and do one whole role. And then I like that because you get like um, a whole contact sheet of um, photos that are kind of of that whole night. And then if you get that contact sheet printed, you can kind of just like, put like a sticker on the bottom like you know so and so this venue this date and it's just like a load of shots that kind of cover the whole venue like you can have wide close-ups and if you keep them contained to that 36 it kind of makes it its own piece of art in by itself which is quite nice um and like i have i try and collect like contact sheets from other photographers um i have a uh nirvana contact sheet from Angela Boatwright that she shot when she was in university when they were playing like her, I think university in Ohio. And and it's just like 36 black and white shots of like Nirvana on stage in the tiny club with like hundred people there. And they, they're amazing. But it's like wow. its own thing, you know. Yeah. That's nuts. I, I, I do so I have a I have a friend of mine that went to school here for photo production and one of the things that he really enjoys is like the tactile nature of film photography and yeah, you know, it's like versus, versus digital it's, it's in itself a product in itself. It's a, it's a work of art. It's not just, you know, a finished printed image. It's, you know, like the science and art meld into a tangible thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It becomes like, it just becomes its own thing. Like there are some people who just can, you can be anybody and you could be doing anything in music and you could carry a point and shoot in your, in your back pocket and you could just, you could be a tour manager or you could be selling merch or you could be doing lights and you could still just in the background be taking these pictures and, and, you know, you don't necessarily have to show someone straight away, but because it's not your, you know, that's not your career path to do so, but you can still like capitalize on, being in those situations and on, and documenting those situations, whether that's like out of an idea to put a zine together or a book together, or if it's just because you purely want to document your, you know, your life and then show that to your family at some point in the future. It doesn't have, we don't have to be turning everything into products, but I just think like there's a lot of opportunities now for people, especially with, you know, all the different social media outlets that we have and ways to put work out there that, um, Photography is now actually second to 
whatever it is else you're doing, if that makes sense. Yeah. Did you, have you seen Val yet on Amazon? Sorry, say that again? Have you seen Val yet on Amazon? It's a documentary on Val Kilmer. No, um, I haven't seen it, no. Do you know anything about it? It's a... Uh, no. So he, he carried her on a camera for most of his life. And somebody went through all of it. I think he had like throat cancer or something recently and kind of had like a mortality uh, awakening. Um, and they made a documentary using a bunch of his old point and shoot video clips. Amazing. Um, you know, from his career in like the eighties and nineties. Uh, and he wasn't doing it for anyone. This wasn't something he had planned all along. It's just, he carried a camera with him and uh just did some home videos while he was working, you know. Exactly. I think that's like the best way to document anything. And it gives you that like rawness. And I try and, I kind of try and tread that line a lot with a lot of the way that I try and shoot. And that's kind of why I was, what I mentioned before about maybe like work using it as a tool to learn and connect with other people is like if the, if the camera's always out and it's always with you, it's kind of just like a part of you and people, you know, just kind of used to seeing that on you. And then when they meet you, they expect you're kind of going to have a camera on you and you can just sort of snap away, almost like treading the line of being amateur. Like you're not setting up shots all the time. You're not asking people to stop and pose. You're just capturing sort of the candid, you know, goings on of wherever it is you are, whether that's just like hanging out with your family or whether it's backstage at a concert and, yeah, those are the things which I'm sure which are very similar to this Val documentary that you said um, like I'm sure in that there's a lot of those and they tend to end up being like kind of my favorite shot to just these like weird one-offs that someone managed to get and you buy by a real flute or like they just felt like they needed to take a picture and or they wanted to document it for their own you know way which i'm sure that like if we didn't all have iphones and we just had these like point and shoot flash cameras we would have more more opportunities to get photos that look and feel that way but i think now that we're taking pictures of a lot of stuff on iphones we could definitely get close but they just don't have that same feeling of what you what when we watch a documentary like that it probably probably looks a certain way and has a certain nostalgic feel where you go oh this, this looks good as an art form which may be like in 30 or 40 years people will look back at shots we took now on an iphone and maybe feel, maybe they'll feel the same way i mean i don't know if i would but maybe, maybe they will yeah you have to be you have to be kind of a, a level of masochist <laughs> to to practice any sort of art form that takes longer than you know an afternoon you know i'm trying to push myself and how long I spend on something because traditionally in my world, you know, the longer you spend on it, the better it turns out. And just like for sure. trying to actively combat the, the need for instant gratification um, has been really difficult, but super rewarding. Yeah. That's, um, but that's one thing that, you know, is, is, is hard. I think for a lot of people across all creative industries, um and that i think is something that shooting photography like by yourself personal projects or maybe in your sense like doing um illustrative work that's for yourself where you can really take your time like and it's for your enjoyment i think what gets lost in the mix is what what we are enjoying doing out of it so when we're always doing it for clients or we're always doing it to get something up on social media or we feel like we have to post something is it might not always be for gratification, but we might always want to feel like we're trying to keep up with something. And then if you don't feel that gratification, you can, I think a lot of people can feel like they drop off a little bit after, you know, a little, a little while they don't have that same, the same brain chemicals aren't mm. there. Um, but that's, that's the doing of the social media company. It's not necessarily the, the doing of our, us personally. Um, I think like they don't, the, the, the pace at which stuff is happening online is, is not good for a, a creative mind. I don't think, I think there's a lot of noise and it can get, you know, a little bit uh, muddy. So, so, so I think like breaks from it and then like kind of going away and working on stuff. This tends to be what I do at least is I try not to be too proactive with it and try and fall into the trap of like posting every day or 
posting all the time or trying to put stuff out there that I get like a response from. I try and go away and work on stuff until I feel like I've built something up that I want to share with others that's more of like a tangible thing, whether that's a zine or whether that's a you know a large blog post or whether it's an idea that I've been playing around with. Then I'll share that all in one go and six months later you'll hear from me again. Because then I like try and like I won't fall into that feeling of like Oh, I didn't post today or next week or you know I'm trying not to plan that I'm trying to let that be spon- a bit more spontaneous and, and if it works it works if it doesn't but at least it makes me makes my brain feel good more of a documentation yeah. and less of a less of a calculated marketing move yeah at, at least for me I was actually just trying to find a very uh, tasteful artistic photo I did of a uh, single chicken nugget as I was sitting on the Metro uh, in DC to show you, but I don't know where it is, but I must Please say email me that when you find it, I will. <laughs> it was tasteful. It was very tasteful. The chicken, nugget, the chicken nugget or the picture. It was the, the yeah, the picture. Yeah. It okay. was a chicken nugget <laughs> and there might've been a urine stain next to it. I don't know, but I just captured it in the right light. And I was, I said, I'm Art. a photographer now. <laughs> Art. <laughs> yeah, you said tasteful. And I was like, the chicken nugget or the photo? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it might have been tasty. I didn't, I didn't no. partake. No, okay. I was fine. <laughs> I was doing okay. <laughs> um, and how do you like, because you've mentioned that you use your photography as a way to get into places like how do you otherwise learn is it just by like is it through like a mentorship do you read do you like listen to podcasts like what do you, how does your when you disappear for six months before you know coming back to uh the culture that is social media um <laughs> what what do you do to like to learn new things and to pick up new habits yeah like i think I definitely like the going, the coming and going from posting stuff to social media. I try and use social media to be more of like an anchor, an anchor for when I really want to show something to someone or, or, you know, when I really feel like doing it. I don't, I don't want to fall into the feeling of like, I have to do that because I feel that because it's my, it's a hobby that turned into a career over 12, 13 years. I like to try and have elements of it that still feel personal and that still feel like a hobby. And I think choosing specifically what I put out there on my side of stuff is very important because there are a lot of other people that share my work that do the everyday sharing for me. So if I'm on tour, like all the band members will be sharing photos or if I'm at a festival and I shoot multiple bands, then I'll send them over and those guys will do the posting. And I try and have that relationship with the internet with myself with like, those photos are for them and as much as like I like them and I would love to show them I think a lot of people know that to some degree I'm already capable of that and I don't want to be fulfilling my audience with just constant photos of a similar thing I would rather just get in touch with people and say like I've got this thing you may be interested in and this is a thing I've been working on and like I hope you enjoy these images like that's kind of where I'd like to be with people who are following what I've been doing as opposed to just constantly putting out stuff every single day. That's very similar. Um, that that's like a first part of kind of the en- enjoyment factor, but then I'll go away and learn a lot of stuff. And a lot of the things I'm reading and learning about, I've got like nothing to do with photos or video or, uh, or music. I um, do a lot of reading around um, sustainability and uh, like reforestation um and like basically regenerative farming practices but getting a bit off key here but this is a lot of the stuff that like i find important and i go away i'm interested in that i learn from that and then maybe for my personal project i'll put a personal project based around this stuff like i've been learning so um recently i've been speaking to these guys in cornwall in the uk who uh, they bring trade back and forth from, I think, Portugal and Spain to the UK by a, a zero waste method using plastic 
sailboats and none, and no petrol. So it's just electricity from solar panels and sail. So they're bringing produce to the south coast of the UK. And that's just the sort of thing that like a project like that going and documenting with people who are putting their time and effort into a system like that that is sustainable. It, it's, we, we could say it's kind of a necessary uh, movement and direction. Yeah. But like photography can take me to those places to learn more about that, to make me still feel connected to what I'm doing and keep learning. And then maybe off the back of that, I'll learn some things I can apply to music or my next band photo shoot, or maybe I'll meet some people down there who are in a band of their own. Or, you know, it's just like this, there's, there's a constant idea of what's next keeps me sort of on my toes. It's completely different away from music, but it's something I'm personally interested in. So if you this is a off the wall question. So if you didn't have a camera in your hand or a film camera, what would you be doing with your life? Uh, it's hard to question because I, 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 I chop and change from stuff a lot. Um, and I like to learn stuff and then practice it out until the point where like I can do that. And then I sort of, drop that and then move on to the next thing and then learn that and so I can do that. And photography has allowed me to sort of document the process or go and learn about that process alongside doing it. And that's kind of why I said before, like taking photos or photography is the secondary thing to um, a lot of other people's work now. Um, and it doesn't take the center stage. It's like more so I would say in like, let's say, um, in like illustration, you could be an illustrator, but if you have a camera with you, you can document your whole process, mm -hmm. showcase that online. You can document your, you know, where, where your projects are going. If they go in print, they go on billboards, you know, the camera's there, it allows you to grow your business that way, but your center stage is you being an illustrator. So in that case, for me, I never had anything that was specifically central to, do, to that. So if I was right now, didn't have a camera with me, I'd probably be doing, I'd probably be back in school learning some stuff because now I'd like to learn a lot more. But I don't know what path another career I would have gone down. I, I changed mm. my mind too often with what I'm interested in. So uh, photography so, allows me to. So you're a renaissance man, basically. Yeah. You just like learning <laughs> and trying to do Just like it. learning. Just like learning. Yeah. Huh. Definitely hated school, but love learning. I, That's I, super ironic. <laughs> yeah. I, as I get older, I more and more i agree with that yeah for sure it's definitely um i think it's more like how the systems for learning are set up and doesn't really lend to people uh not well doesn't lend to everyone let's say there are a lot of people who are happy to sit down every day and put the work in and put the hours in and they can they can see themselves in five or six years of where that ends whereas for me i'm like i can barely see what's happening at the end of next week um, so let's just get through this one. Right. Yeah, I think that everybody can share that sentiment right now. Just, just one more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let's just get through this week. Um, actually, that's a really good question. Uh, did the pandemic, how, how did the pandemic affect your creative work? Because a lot of your work is tied to music. And since that wasn't going on, what did you, how did, how did you react to that? So, yeah, definitely like the, when, at the beginning of the sort of like pandemic, I got coronavirus right at the beginning before we really knew what it was. Didn't have any vaccines, had no way to test. Saw some friends who had been on tour through Italy at the time. There was loads of tours coming to the UK. All the tours were then like pretty much gone Italy, France, UK. They all ended. And I saw a bunch of friends and got the virus then. And yeah, it was, not for a lot of people wasn't very fun, but I didn't know for sure if that's what I got. I lost my sense of taste and smell for a good month. So I assumed that that was, you know, what was kicking around. After that and everything locked down, it's pretty much been no big tours since the beginning. So that was like March, what was that, March 2019? March 2020, 2020 yeah. 
2020. Yeah. So since then, no big tours. And yeah, we've had a few shows here or there, and that's been fun to you know have some opportunities to. We had a few like pilot shows where they were allowed to test the water coming back out with a smaller capacity festival, uh, which was I got to go to download. I went with uh, Frank Carter and the Rattlesnakes, and they had. I was I was, was going to ask you if you've ever gotten to shoot nice. Frank. Nice. Uh, yeah, so that was like one of the projects they were putting together a download festival put together and that was really fun to shoot that frank got to play some new new tracks up there so the audience were reacting to like new music as well as uh like sort of the first festival back and it was a bit of a weird feeling i think a lot of people in the crowd were very much like i haven't done this for six months to a year I'm not sure how to react. So some people were like absolutely hammered because they hadn't really been drinking. And a lot of people were just like, stay away from me. Um, even sounds like, a, sounds everything. like a normal show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in a, in a way, yeah. Um, and I, when that show happened, I kind of had a feeling like, all right, things are going to kind of kick back off now. But, but yeah, since then it hasn't really been normal. We've had a few shows here and there, some small tours. Um, Europe, we haven't been over to Europe. Usually, you know, with bands, I'll tour Australia, America, and Europe a couple times a year, yeah. and none and none of those have none of those have happened since. So, I sort of pivoted into going um, kind of back to my roots and speaking to just like local businesses and uh, local local clients, local friends, just seeing what everyone else was doing, and I trying not to panic too much there was a little bit of a frantic you know six months where it was like oh shit this really may not come back like it may be fucked forever because a lot of people may just go bust um because there was a, there were a lot of we had some support from the government but there was really minimal support for the industry so like i was expecting a lot more venues to close um and a lot of crew members to have to find other other work. And it's been tough, I think, across the board for a lot of people. Um, I'm very lucky that, I mean, at least with my camera, I can sort of pivot into other things. And uh, yeah, I just started working, working locally and uh, just supporting local businesses and uh, helping out where I can with the other digital skills that I have, um, Photoshop and video editing and things like that. Um, and yeah, just sort of, kind of filled the gaps and balanced it with a bit of music work here or that. How, uh, so that's something that I think a lot of young creatives could benefit from. Um, some of what we like to do on the podcast is like give a little bit of inside information on how, you know, for each, for each field that we have on, we've had designers, we've had musicians, um, how would you recommend someone start out if they were interested in doing work for small businesses um personally this is a really this this information comes at a really opportune time for me because that's what i'm going through at the moment creatively um but how would you if you know if you were a kid in high school that has a camera and likes to shoot and edit like how would you encourage them to start doing it professionally yeah it's, it's crazy right now because if you like it's so accessible more accessible than ever to get like yeah, exactly. really good really good like industry level equipment for like really not that much money um almost like most of the cameras in the last i don't know five to ten years the sensors are like big enough to print they're big enough to film 1080 which is hd um so like all of your like technicals are covered with like even just picking up like a 300 pound camera like a five canon 5d or canon 6d that does like HD video and that shoots like you know a 6K uh, digital image. Like that's a really good starting place. Like it's so accessible, and if you're able to access that, then you have then like some of the biggest marketing tools ever at your fingertips now, like social media. So those two like stepping stones are really accessible, um, and then it's just putting the the time into making making friends, seeing what your friends are up to, nurturing your other creative friends which is probably the most important thing. Like if you have friends who are oh. musicians or if you're, 
I'm trying to give you all a hug right now. (laughs) Yeah, and your green screen's clipping out. (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. If if you've got friends who are in bands, friends who are artists, friends who are painters, um, you know, digital artists, friends who are making NFTs, you know, anything. Do we really need NFTs? Is that really? Hell yeah, we're we're going to make one. (laughs) We're going to make one. That's, I mean, that's something for a whole nother. I'm not really into it, but it's something for a whole nother. It's a very big yeah. conversation. We had a we had a um, guest on a couple of weeks, a month ago, a couple of months ago, a couple of months ago, who was really big into NFTs, and she kind of gave us the lowdown. Made, and, yeah, she made some NFTs. Yeah, and uh, not sure, not sure how I feel. <laughs> I feel like my work isn't yeah. super conducive yeah. to NFTs. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's definitely an interesting place, but but if you were uh, if you were young you know 13 14 year old and you kind of a bit like me were unsure of what to do didn't really feel like anything any schools were offering were kind of like yeah come do this and everything that i saw out there was like i don't want to do any of this stuff i kind of just want to go and go to bed go and watch bands i want to play music and kind of that's all i want to do and i wanted to be involved in that and so like i just went and did that and took my camera along with me and just i would take pictures and I would put the pictures up on Flickr at the time and send them straight over to the band like the night after or the day after the show. And I would just try and then meet them again in the future and just build up a network of friends. And what was your that, what was your return rate on doing that? Because, you know, they say you have to get turned down a shit ton of times before someone says yes. Like, what was the... Well, I think like then there were maybe not that many people i mean definitely there were not that many people doing it like i would go to some shows and it would be like me and one other person taking pictures and i think like i saw a few other that's kind of what got me into it was seeing other people at shows like taking pictures and i was like oh that looks pretty fun like i carry a camera but i've never thought about actually like applying that to shooting a whole show i've only just kind of snapped photos here or there i've never thought of it as like oh you could like run around the stage or you could be backstage and shoot the whole night and turn it into something it kind of clicked um that there was more to it than just sort of just taking pictures of your friends in the mosh pit or whatever you know it's like there was more there was more on the other side of that and now i think like there are so many tools available that you know you, you can shoot like pretty shaky average video and you can then put it in premiere and turn it into something amazing like there's so many plugins there's so many little you know, like tips, little tips and tricks that are out there on YouTube that people can learn so much so quickly that it's all accessible. So when I, if I was starting out now, like there's so much stuff and it's like, there's an abundance and it's really Almost easy. overwhelming. <laughs> oh, but for me, it's so overwhelming because yeah, personally, it's like I don't nah. have the time to like, <laughs> in a way, I don't have the time to go back and like research it from like a bottom perspective up, mm-hmm. like, started like seeing it afresh would be kind of amazing in a way like you know occasionally i'll bump into something and be like oh this is really cool i like this person's process they've been doing this and they've been doing that and then i'll kind of study that and figure out how they've done it and be like oh that's pretty cool that's like a new technique they figured out and then six months down the line you'll see like everybody's applied that to their project it's a kind of like goes in these waves um but definitely like the biggest the biggest thing is stay late like Stay as late as you can with everything. Like, if you want to get to know people, you got to wait until they've clocked off whatever it is they're doing to get to know them. Because on stage, someone's very different from when they're off stage. Someone's very different when they're outside the venue, when they're in the van. And like, you know, there are many layers to lots of people. And if you take the time to get to know them and people trust you, you just, they're going to be happy to have you around because, you know, ultimately, if you're good to hang out with, that's the main thing. Your camera is going to be there, but if you you're not a great person to hang around with, people are not going to invite you back. So, got to be a got to be a good person. Just you know, either have a round or be exceptionally good at taking pictures. Buy a round for the band. That helps. Yeah, if, yeah. If if they're not a straight edge band, yeah, a round of <laughs> Um, this is going to be like a super technical question. Um, but how do you expose for like fire or a light show at a concert? 
Yeah, I mean, just <laughs> I get lucky, get lucky, and just sort of like kind of figure out use maybe the first few fire, like sort of uh, the pyro flames as a little test, kind of quickly look back at what the let the camera do all the work and look back at what the settings were, and then flip back to manual and maybe have a look and see if you can in your brain figure out whether that was a fluke or whether that's going to work for the next time the pyro goes off and uh, speak to the lighting guy and get some tips when the when the pyro is going to go or when the cannons are going to go with confetti or whatever it is they've got on in the show but yeah a lot of the times with fire because it really depends on like how the the person has set the show up because there's like many different ways for them to set them up on their little consoles and the type mm-hmm. of fire that they are um, or go on tour with a band who have got fire and then you've got like a month to practice. And so, <laughs> there you go. Try not to get burned. Easy. There you yeah, go. Try not to get burned. Yeah, there's a few, there's a few uh, hairy moments that you standing behind the drum kit if you've got pyro going off kind of in a bit mm. of a triangle above you, get your elbows toasty. Yeah. Don't want to James Hetfield that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's tricky. But fire, fire is a tricky one. Yeah, it's a bit of a fluke to get. But it looks really good when you pull it off. <laughs> yeah, if you pull it off, yeah, it looks great. Yeah. Um, Speaking of really good, um, can you talk to us a little bit about your inspiration or what made you decide to um, go to Iceland and take all those photos that you have available that everyone could purchase on? www.edmasonphoto.com they get that right yeah yeah edmasonphoto.com yeah there's i mean there's all sorts of trips up there um just some sort of like personal trips and holidays and travels and you know it was really it was a place like i definitely wanted to visit to and i was lucky enough to um uh sort of spend a bit of time over there over the course of a few visits and got to i didn't really know what to expect of the place um but yeah, just sort of spent some time around there um, traveling. And it has this unique, or well, at least traveling in February, sort of like winter time, either either side of December, you know, sort of unique light. And that, you know, the first time going there and you sort of have that opportunity to take photos in that light is, is just quite something. And I, and I think a lot of Europe in the North, you, you'd get that. Maybe the same in some, some parts of Canada, but you get sort of like four hours of, real daylight and then you sort of get like a two hour window either side of it where everything is just sort of like a purple or blue hue Mm -hmm. um but yeah definitely like this place it's just it was on my list of places to to really visit and spend some time and it's just like another world you know there are not many places you can go where you see you look everywhere you look feels like a sort of a you know like a different biome You, you drive through moss and then you know, a couple of hours later, you're driving through black sand, and then another hour later, you're driving through just you know, blue turquoise ice, and and then you go another hour, and you're driving through like an orange valley. It, there's not really many places like that, you know, where everything a lot of a lot of interesting inspiration comes from just spending time there with the camera. And a lot of those photos are just shot on a, a 35 mil. That's what I was about to ask. Yeah. Yeah. How did you, how did you get some of those tones and that just, yeah. Yeah. Just that was a lot of that was like expired film and Kodak portrait shot on a, a Contax G2. Wow. Um, and, and then like those cameras are notoriously fragile. And I was worried that like, it was just not really gonna, you know, withstand sort of miserable conditions and being rainy or really cold. Mm. And, but it, but it's, it's a great camera. I really recommend it. And lens is a really fun, um, you know, there's no, there's a bit unusual, but there's no manual focus on the actual lens itself. It's the manual focus is on like a thumb wheel on the back of the camera. So mm. you, it's really hard to know whether you've got something really in the focus manually. It's close to impossible to know. Um, you, right. could, you could never do a portrait of someone and really know because, it gives you an average like meter reading, like zero point two meters on the thumb wheel. It's like, how the hell do I know if this person in front of me is zero? So like you kind of it's a kind of a bit weird to use on, on that in that sense, but once you get used to it, um camera is solid, so fun to use, especially somewhere like that, you know, just 
have your yeah. rolls of film and you just snap, 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 snap. No need to no need to have a digital camera looking at the back. Just enjoy being there. It's such a stunning place. Where else is on your list of places to shoot? Like, um, like do you have like a bucket list geographical location? Yeah, yeah there's um, there's definitely like a fair few places. Um, there's one place I've been looking at recently, which is called Kamchatka, which is in uh, Russia. It's in the far east, and it's almost like Russia's Iceland. I only know of that place because of a board game. Oh, I'm not really? gonna lie. It's it's in uh, risk. What, what it's game? it's a it's a I territory in risk. risk. Okay, yeah. Well it's a little peninsula. I don't know if it's little, I think it's probably quite big, but it looks amazing. It looks very similar in a way to Iceland, but with sort of Soviet era old mining towns and uh whaling towns around there. It just I don't know, it looks like a real fun place to explore. I got a thing for like tin corrugated sort of like tin that you see in the in the Iceland pictures. Uh, I got a thing for that. So any sort of place that's got these old churches and made out of tin or old houses made out of these corrugated tin or corrugated iron, yeah, just I love the look of those. So I've been sort of uh, spying up a few locations that I've got some some of that tucked away there. But yeah, check it out. That place is looks pretty far out. We'll have to add that to our list of uh, list of vacation spots. Um, it, yeah, yeah both, both places you mentioned were were super cold, and it's it's funny because like I I enjoy the cold. Um, oh yeah. But my wife is from Brazil and does not. We went to New York for uh, my birthday this year, and she hated like every minute of it. <laughs> she was yeah, freezing. Yeah. But but you also the cold brings that kind of light in a way like i was explaining mm -hmm. with the those hues of the purples and the blues and that you see in those photos that like it's just it's the perfect thing to shoot and like i'd live somewhere and happily just you know go out in that light and have friends visit and take pictures and you'd be happy as anything in that light it's just, it doesn't get boring to take pictures of the best. Is that your is that your retirement game plan is to buy a oh, cottage yeah. in Iceland and oh let's go I'll take it <laughs> heck yeah um do you do you tend to prefer like going on tour where everything is consistent or do you like the the variety of like a festival like I I don't know if you enjoy traveling like with the same group of people for like a long period or if you want to like yeah, just so, do it for an evening or a weekend and then go travel somewhere else, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, I've been fortunate enough to like work with a fair amount of different artists on tour. And one band that I've worked with over a long period of time is the man Architects. And I've been working with them for six coming up, maybe, yeah, six years now. And, um, and it's Final been, applause. <laughs> yes, it's been one of these, things where like they were a band that I grew up taking photos at the beginning of my sort of photo career, you know, just going to shows and taking pictures. They were one band that were, that would just happen to sort of be, you know, playing a lot of shows around that time with their album Hollow Crown. And um, I took some photos uh, at their Follow the Water um, music video. And that sort of was around the time where stuff like kind of really kicked into gear for me taking pictures and, uh, they brought up a lot of other bands with them too. So they've always been a band who have always taken other bands in the UK or Europe on tour and given them an opportunity to, you know, play to an audience that would appreciate them. And yeah, it's been it's been great to be involved with them. And I've been lucky enough to work with them over a long period of time. Whereas, you know, there's been lots of other opportunities to hop on tours with other artists, which would have maybe offered more of a like a diverse year. But I try and I think I prefer uh, relationships in that sense over having like many, you know, instead of working with like a wide variety of artists, I prefer to have that deeper relationship with a few to get, you're going to get better photos on the other side of that. I think um, you're going to be able to tell more stories and you're going to have lifelong friends, which to me, that's really important than just having sort of a really wide career, really diverse. Um, bands and acts across that so when you go on tour 
yeah, I do love going on tour because it's with like a great group of people who I've chose to spend a lot of time with. So for me, I, I do really enjoy that. And, and then occasionally you will go on tour with someone new when you have an opportunity or you're someone you'd like to work with. And um, yeah, you're reminded that right at the beginning, you've got to then get that relationship into, you've got to build that relationship and you're out of your comfort zone. And there's, there's a lot of learning in tight spaces to be done again. So there are all, you know, pros and cons to both, but um, I definitely like the thought of uh, kind of having friends for life and making work with people who you really enjoy being around. Yeah, I still need to buy tickets for their 2022 tour. Uh, I missed the opportunity when it, before it got postponed when they were going out with uh, Loathe, but uh, I, I have yet to see them. Every time they've been stateside, I've missed it just because, you know, well, Tuesday night, three hours yeah. away doesn't really seem super conducive. Yeah. <laughs> They'd still yeah. be playing Warped if it was around. <laughs> yeah, they, well, they yeah. toured with While She Sleeps, I think on their oh it was two or three years ago and they came within a couple hours and i missed it i was very upset <laughs> but well hopefully next time they're somewhere somewhere nearer first thing i'm gonna do when i hang up this call <laughs> is go check and see where they're going um, yeah yeah it's been tricky but tours just keep getting pushed back pushed back so. what's the first thing you do when you arrive into a new city for me, uh, if I'm waking up in the morning, I'll check out where I am, sort of like look on Google Maps, figure out where, where we are, like what is the venue, have I been here before? And then you'll find out where you can get a good cup of coffee or if we've, if we've got the stuff on the bus, make a good cup of coffee and then figure out where we're going to go and get some food or something. But I love to have an explore. I'm lucky that during my day, I don't have to immediately do anything really early in the morning. So I usually get a little walk in before. When I'm back home, I tend to walk every morning um, out and about near here. And yeah, I need that on tour. I've got to get like a good hour or 45 minute sort of stroll in. Um, yeah. And sometimes mm. you can be like parked in the middle of nowhere and it, the walk can be really shit. But it, you've got to get it. <laughs> Do you listen to anything when you go on your walks or is it just to enjoy the ambient sounds of wherever you are? Take some, take the, take headphones, go for a little stroll, go take some pictures. I tend to do a lot of, I'll take pictures while I'm walking and I've got a lot of street stuff and a lot of in between. So a lot of stuff from, you know, different countries where I've gone on these walks and, I'll just snap and snap and snap and so I've just used that as a bit of you know alone time just because when you're back in a venue and if it's or and you're on the bus usually the backstage is pretty small bus is pretty mm -hmm. small it's hard to get you know some time to yourself without you know locking Swing yourself your arms, in a road, dark get room some, somewhere some yeah space <laughs> yeah that's it yeah so it can it can be a good opportunity to sort of you know get some exercise shoot something that's a bit different maybe just take a i'll take you i'll usually take like three or four cameras and two of them will probably be film cameras one will be just like a toy or like an old camera that i'm not sure works but quite right and i'll take it out and i give it a few test runs and see what happens and yeah th i use those usually those walks as an opportunity to pick up some in between shots street portraits or um yeah so it, you know sort of like street photography stuff and yeah, how, maybe maybe just use it as a bit of a meditation you know you could just take the film camera out and just you and that camera i was literally about really... to say that sounds super meditative yeah especially um, if you've got nothing to do right it's like you've got nothing to do for an hour you, you know you where you've got to be you can just open the camera look through the viewfinder take a few shots and before you know it an hour has disappeared you know what do you what do you traditionally like take with you on tour? Like aside from your work uh, gear, I tend to take like a point and shoot or a range finder. So I'll take like maybe I don't know if I've got anything to hand right here, but yeah, just like a little point and shoot, thirty-five mil. I like half frames, which are like these little things, and they shoot they shoot half a frame of thirty-five mil. So you get seventy-two shots per 
roll and it shoots like a strip this way when you're holding it like that so you're shooting portrait holding it this way or landscape holding it this way uh so it's a bit opposite huh. but like but like it kind of it kind of it's fun to use because you know you're shooting film and you're going to get that style and that look uh 2.8 lens that can take a decent little portrait um but they're fun to have because they fit in your pocket and you can just snap away and you know you're going to get that sort of colors and tones that you like so i'll take something like that and then i'll usually take a medium format camera with me and a few rolls of 120 film and that'll be for maybe maybe if we've got like a nice day off or something in between a couple shows where we've got a break and i've got a few hours maybe we can i can do a longer walk or explore or if i know we're going to have an opportunity somewhere like i love being in these really you know diverse tours like if we're in america i think we did um some shows at uh in milwaukee and there's a venue there i think it's called the eagles club and it's opposite the hotel that like Jeffrey Dahmer stayed in. And it's opportunities like that where you've got like this old venue, this bit of story where I would never find myself here unless I was on tour. So I'm gonna just use this stuff I've heard in my head about him in this hotel and make some images from that. And you know, if you look the images are on my Instagram and they're like there's like this red neon light from the Eagles Club. And the whole car park is just like drenched in neon red. And I've just wound my winder on and my medium format and just made it all red. And, and there's some shots of Jeffrey Dahmer's hotel from across the road. And it's like just these thoughts in my head that I've heard. And I'm like, how do I apply this little story that everyone's talking about to the in-betweens of the, the afternoon that I've got, these few hours here or there. And like, those are, that's just like one example of, you know, if you're on a tour for a month, you've got the opportunity to do that every day. So you can just have some fun and play around and try and turn this little story into some photos, see what's on the other side of it. Have you ever thought about doing like postcard packs from when you're on tour, like of prints? Yeah, I definitely, um, definitely had a little thought about that. I've got some things in the pipeline. Just, I'm one of these people who, comes up with a lot of ideas and kind of writes the ideas down and maybe does like a week on the idea and then forget that I came up with that idea. So postcard packs was like one of the things that I wanted to do a while ago, but I think I'm going to try and turn the in-betweens from tours into maybe more of a small zine or like kind of a little uh, newspaper or photo book or something. Cause I did a zine from the um, architects uh, Royal Albert Hall show and I enjoyed putting that together and that was a fun process. So I think I'd like to do that with something else on tour. Um, so yeah, maybe maybe something soon. Awesome. Um, well, we want to be respective of uh, of your time, Ed. We understand that it's a little bit later there than it is here. Um, for okay. those of you watching, it is five hours uh, later than U.S. time. So right around now, it is uh, I think nine o'clock. Nine o'clock in the evening um is there anywhere like online other than your website and instagram people can like see your work are there like publications that people can see what you've worked on um, um yeah you can dig through old krang magazines old q magazines um yeah have a little dig around online there's a few other bits and bobs out there but yeah pretty much these days just the instagram i'm working on a a new website which i hope will be out soon which is more of like an old school blog I'm just going to try and use more and more, which is kind of, yeah, kind of like an old school Flickr or an old school Tumblr. I think like I definitely feel I enjoy putting out the images in that format a lot more than on uh, social media on our phone. So I'm just going to play around with that a little bit more in the future and see what's on the other side. Awesome. Rock on. Well, Ed, for real, I've really appreciated the, uh, the perspective on disappearing and being a creative mind. Um, well, thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, I, th I think a lot of young people could really benefit from balancing the the need for attention, but also the need to genuinely like be creative and pay attention to what they're doing in the moment. Um, yeah, absolutely. I feel like we yeah. don't we, that message doesn't get out as much as it should.
But you heard uh, it here heard first. It. I'll <laughs> this. Actually, and no. Uh, there's a guy named Cal Newport. <laughs> nope. We, no. They heard it here first. <laughs> they heard it here first. That's how we're going to do it. I'll give you some book recommendations, Ed. <laughs> At I the tail end of this. No, um, but yeah. Ends. You know what, Phil? All right. <laughs> uh Can this I has been this? frame this podcast uh again i'm nate we've been chatting with ed mason a uh, photographer from the uk um phil would you like to do it this time since I'll i messed it, it up I'll yesterday do it properly yes i'll do it properly <laughs> uh but first check out all of ed's work on his instagram at ed mason photo yeah correct and www.edmasonphoto.com and purchase one of his, his two for two. awesome prints of Iceland. I will repeat myself. Check out his work. <laughs> it's amazing. And everybody, uh, stay hungry. Stay creative. Have a great day.